we have a whole series of uh, talks today. Uh, our programs usually consist of tech chats with leading entrepreneurs uh, who are doing business in the locale that we're holding the event in and also in China or another Asian emerging market, but usually China because I think that that is the first market that uh, is the most intriguing as well. So we have a couple of tech chats that we're going to be uh, uh, launching into later in the program. And then we have our usual uh, venture capital deal maker panel, uh, which wraps up uh, the programming part of the uh, session. And then, of course, we have our cocktail reception. So I hope you'll stay around for that as well. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our keynote talk as well. Um, and uh, we're so lucky to have uh, Lord Wei here, uh, Nat Wei. Um, he is a serial social entrepreneur, uh, and he's working on this UK-China connection theme as well. Uh, he's going to be making a few remarks, and uh, we also uh, are going to be having some remarks and some Q&A with Eric Van der Klees, who's the head of the technology accelerator here at Level 39. So uh, let's give them a, let's give everyone a round of applause and welcome them uh, to the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Eric van der Klee. Firstly, welcome to Level 39. We're delighted to have you here. If you've not been here before, uh, Level 39 is uh, one of the largest accelerator spaces and incubators in Europe. Uh, we deal with fintech, retail tech, futures cities tech, and now security technologies. Uh, we're a bit of a startup. We're um, just one year old, so uh, it's almost our birthday, and uh, we're uh, we've been very lucky. You've got to be lucky, right? So we've been very lucky, and uh, the, the, we're very happy that our place is completely full. We had over 500 companies want to be here, and we're just at the phase of figuring out what we do to help uh, Level 39 connect with the rest of the world. So this is most timely. Uh, because it's exactly the kind of thing that we're quite keen to do more. Now, I wanted to quickly introduce, if I may, uh, Lord Wei, uh, who is actually the, uh, the Lord of Tech City. I know you, he laughs when I say that, but he is the Lord of Shoreditch, <laughs> which is because you live there, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. But uh, Lord Wei is actually very interesting because not only he's the, the youngest parliamentarian ever, peer person to enter parliament, but he's also uh, the first... Uh, uh, you know, UK-born uh, Chinese uh, person in Parliament, and that's that is a huge responsibility. But he has also what people don't really know quite so much is that he also has a great deal of experience and interest in things like Teach First and Big Society, which is a, a, a huge depth of investment in society as well as being involved in venture capital, tech companies, and everything. So I'm going to invite him to come up and. Uh, uh, just uh, tell you a little bit of what he's thinking at the moment and, and to, to, you know, to, to have some remarks. And then I'm going to start grilling him for some questions. Yep. So, Great. Lord Nat Way. Thank you. I'll, I'll just come up here to rest sure. this. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to be here with you uh, tonight. And thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, in fact, it, this brings back lots of uh, happy memories for me because about 12, 13 years ago, uh, I and a small band of people uh, uh, left places like McKinsey and other organizations. And two floors below, I believe, the 37th floor, we actually were given space to set up Teach First, which is a, an education charity. And little did I know back then that in, in a, over a decade, I'd be in the same place, but two floors above, in this kind of amazing space. And we're very grateful for being able to have, the, have this event here tonight. A decade so, uh, every two years. Yeah, so every, yeah, two floors, so probably in 10 years' time, it would be something else two floors above. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to say a few short remarks. I think, I think at these kinds of events, it's the conversation and the dialogue where we get the kind of the richness. But I'm particularly excited to be here to kind of um, give this keynote for Silicon Dragon, I guess for three reasons. I, I trained at McKinsey Inn and worked in VC, so still can't get the three, uh, three points out of me. Um, one is because of the work uh, I now do, a lot of work between the UK and China, this is you know, the event, one of the events, where we're seeing the interface of many different kinds of interfaces between the East and West. And uh, this last few months, this last year, has been a real, as you know, probably an inflection uh, period in the relationship between the UK and China. We had an uh, improvement of relations with the Prime Minister going over last year. But one of the things that I think probably uh, people don't necessarily know about uh, the last, I'd say, six months in terms of uh, the kind of UK-China link 
is not so much the political side, which I think has been well publicised, but I would say there's a real change, a real sea change going on in the technological relationship between the UK and China. I'd say even 12 months ago, most people I would speak in, in and around Tech City and in the tech scene in the UK that I know would be terrified of China, would think China, you go to China, there's hardly any innovation and a lot of your IP will get stolen, just to be kind of really brutal about it. Um, and certainly from what I've been seeing, that's starting to shift. Certainly the companies I visited in China uh, over the last kind of four or five months, the rate of innovation in China now, I'd say in some areas of tech, is now outpacing the West, which I think is a huge shift, probably, frankly, more important than whether David Cameron or anyone else gets to hang out with the president in, in China and so on. And that, what that shift means is that the balance is changing. Now the future is going to be less about, you know, should we go to China, take our technology, and what, the, what are the risks? Yes, that's important, but it's going to be more about how do we create hybrid initiatives between places like the UK and places like China, bring the best of the tech out there, uh, you know, we can see companies like Tencent and their innovations are astounding. How can companies like Tencent, companies like Huawei, which are here, work with the best of breed over here and combine Western brands, Western content, Western innovation with Chinese innovation? Chinese process innovation in particular is incredible. Uh, you know, Tencent last, I think last week, the week before, one of the big things that's came, come out, as you probably know, is this whole Chinese New Year red envelope mm -hmm. campaign them becoming a payment provider and, and millions, you know, eventually billions of people exchanging money in terms of gifts over effectively what was a, a chat platform, right? Really innovating uh, f very, very quickly. So I think that's really exciting to kind of be part of that scene here to, uh, tonight. Secondly, shortage. Uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, people have talked a lot since Tech City sort of established, kind of grew as a phenomenon. It was, it was here actually long before the government gave it an, a name. Um, but I think one of the developments that I think is, is exciting and certainly one I want to kind of espouse, particularly as Chinese are seeking to come in into this area as well as uh, businesses and investors looking to go out from here into places like China, is to establish that whilst uh, you know, we talk about Silicon Valley, we talk about Silicon Roundabout, there's wonderful things to be learned from the exchange between the West Coast, America, New York, and London in terms of that exchange, I think we also need to assert, and I think people have been doing that in Tech City, that we're, we're also different here. This is a different phenomenon that we're seeing. And certainly one that I am passionate about is the fact that Tech City, the UK, this technology environment has a unique positioning. We have one amazing advantage left over from the British Victorian legacy and, beyond, and before that, which is the time zone. We're in the center of the world in terms of time zone, we have pretty much all the languages in the world here. So I see Tech City, the UK, the tech scene here, not just as another Me Too Silicon Valley that's just sort of in Europe, but actually a place where if you are either coming from China or from Asia and you want to globalize, this is a perfect place to do that. Or if you're here and you want to enter the non-English web, which by the way is growing faster and will eclipse the English web, is, I think is already done so now, um, this is a great place to do it from. And uh, the, the question is, how do we build the networks and the platforms that enable that uh, to happen? That ecosystem that starts here, that leverages the time zone, the language, and goes global. Finally, I think why I'm, I'm excited to be here tonight is, uh, I think right now, this year, is a very special and potentially risky moment for uh, technology and investment all over the world. Um, there was a, a very influential Wired article, I think, that came out in the last week or so, which talked about the, the, the risk of a backlash in Silicon Valley from the general population. 2014, some say, could be the year in which the tech elite are seen to be as bad as bankers. Because I can see in Shoreditch the property prices have quadrupled, I think, in the last decade. And the jobs, if you're a taxi driver or a linguist, I trained as a, as a linguist at university, you know, we're afraid. Basically, people are afraid that this technology investment uh, productivity gain is benefiting only a few and not uh, the wider population. And of course, the Industrial Revolution did the same, certainly to the rural economy, and had to catch up. We had to spend 50 years, certainly in this country, innovating new kinds of jobs and trades that allowed the rest of the population to kind of benefit from the tech boom that happened then. And the question will be, in my view, do we just sit back and wait for the 
the inevitable riots and revolution and the, the kind of backlash that we're going to see from the population as tech, te tech investors and techno technological entrepreneurs? Or do we actually ourselves start to pioneer different ways to um, enable that, that technology to, uh, and that wealth that's generated in those opportunities? What, are, what is the job that replaces the taxi driver of the 21st century? What is the job that replaces the jobs that robots like that one are, are going to take? We have to start thinking about that now rather than 10 years' time or five years' time when it's too late. And the interesting thing is I think China and the interface between China and the West may be a good starting point for that. Many of the companies that come, are coming over from China, particularly the ones that are globalizing, Huawei is here tonight, you've got companies that are higher, have already pioneered what we you know, in Silicon Valley would call the stock ops and options culture, uh, actually distributing wealth among employees to create more entrepreneurs and then encourage them to figure out how to kind of make that wealth spread around, but still following fundamentally a capitalist entrepreneurial approach. And so I think there's going to be really interesting conversations to be had between East and West about how we make that model work and, uh, and to try and avert some of the crisis that otherwise we would, we would face. So again, it's really exciting to be here tonight. I'm looking forward to the conversation, looking forward to the networking. I hope you have a fantastic event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nat. Um, it's an interesting conundrum that to, to pick up on the last point that you raised, which is if we, through our social uh, engagement with the people within our companies, create and spread our wealth that we're creating more evenly through that, as well as inspiring them to maybe start their own companies, might we not be responsible for sparking a whole load of new innovation that is going to automate even more stuff. Aren't we actually part of that same cyclic problem then? Yeah, I think we have to distinguish between different phases of, of the, say, internet revolution. I think the first phase, which is pre predominantly purely digital, so, you know, Shoreditch, the two, two industries I think that drive, you will know better than me, that, that drive the tech city phenomenon is advertising on the one hand, still yeah. roughly 40 to 50% of actual industry is mainly advertising, creative industries, if you like, and then the other half is, is sort of digit mobile app development and, and sort of those digital uh, technologies, you know, uh, big data analysis, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, there's a lot of focus right now on getting kids, for example, to do coding, which I think yeah. is wonderful, you know, but eventually we're going to have 10 million kids who know how to code. Uh, and it's kind of too late, but in a way, it's kind of too late in five years time if we have a million coders, because actually I think the next wave is less about just purely pure digital plays. It's going to be much more about the interplay between the physical world and digital. One of the reasons why I'm dressed today is I just came from a project I'm involved with where we're working on 3D printing based innovation. And a lot of the industries of the future, which is frankly where I think some of these future trades and jobs are going to come from, are less your mobile app development, which is more you know, coming into the kind of, the, 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 the kind of peak, the kind of uh, maturing phase. Uh, even you know, Twitter, for example, is, re is starting recently to slow down in terms of its growth. It's going to be more in that, how do you interface with the real physical world? So, and then it's about, okay, some of these technologies, the taxis, the, the cars that drive themselves, the robots, they're going to displace some things which are easy to displace, right? C certain service orientation, you know, I was in Hong Kong recently and a lot of the restaurants, you're ordering your, your menu on, on an iPad, which puts a lot of kind of waitressing uh, or waitering, you know, jobs at risk. But there are other jobs, you know, there, there are jobs which are still harder for technology to, to take away. Ones that require social intelligence, you know, just mm. building a relationship or creative intelligence, pure, you know, the pure creative intelligence side, still very hard for computers to do. Manual dexterity, I mean, robots can do a lot, but it's still gonna be quite tough, say, to clean a room because the objects are distributed in quite a man, you know, random way. And I think if we can think about what are the kind of innovations and jobs and trades that can harness, that can be the next wave so that the, you know, if you were going to be a taxi driver or if you were going to be in one of these other industry, uh, industries which are going to die out, yeah. you can kind of move across. So actually, you, you, you raised the topic of robots. And just in case anyone's wondering what that is in the corner there, that is uh, Sherlock. Actually, no, that, the, the picture of the person's face there is not Sherlock. That's uh, Axel. Wave Axel, say hi. Um, so uh, this is uh, Sherlock. <laughs> Sherlock is a new robot. It's called Beaming Technology, if you like. And it's uh, telepresence technology. It's a bit of a segue on with a stick and an iPad at the top. Obviously, there's a lot of software in there. But more interestingly, to your point about automation, 
The um, company that's uh, developing these has created as a platform, and there's a, one of the companies here, London Brand Management, is developing artificial intelligence to go into these that could replace human tasks. So this could be a reception, mm -hmm. and so when you arrive, you say, um, where is my conference? Uh, what's your name? Please follow me. And so that kind of artificial intelligence does replace the simple yeah. human hospitality tasks, yeah. uh, which you mentioned quite rightly, start with the iPad when you're ordering, but goes on and can go even further. Yeah. But if you think back to the Luddite movement, I suppose, is probably where this first was crystallized. At the beginning of the first Industrial Revolution, when there was this huge fear that automation of these looms and things like that were going to completely disintermediate the, 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 you know, the, the weavers and the spinners and things like that. Isn't it true to say that actually what we've created is a whole plethora of other industries that are needed to make things like the automated looms, like the robots, and with your 3D printing uh, exper experience now, that of course has also democratized manufacturing, hasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think there's two elements to this. One is about, um, you know, there's a, there's a book I think that just come out, two Oxford professors have, have talked about, you know, analyzed different sectors of, of, of labor, the labor force, and basically suggested that because of robots and 47% of the US working population's jobs may be at risk, or at least the, the value of their wages may decrease dramatically over the, the coming years, over the next decade, as AI and other technologies come on, come on stream. So one, move, one part of it is thinking intelligently, and you need people to actually think and develop this about jobs, new kinds of trades that use the technology and work with the technology to enhance it and make it kind of work in different local mm. contexts. But the other side, which I guess if you know, people like Marx were also writing at the time, is actually wages may not be the solution anymore. If you look across the world, wages are falling because automation, offshoring, all of these different technologies and, and, and movements are making it very hard. The real question is assets, ownership. The rich are rich in Tech City or Silicon Valley and it, because they own the homes, they own the companies, they own the assets. Whereas the people, everybody else, actually, you know, because some things are getting cheaper, you know, getting online and so on is getting cheaper, life is sort of standing still, but standing still is not good enough you somehow have got, to, got to ride that asset curve too. So one of the other questions is not just could the job of the future be you know, being a, a local 3D printer in, designer, but the fact that that person owns their company, they can own a share of what's the value that's generated in that as well. Well, that's fascinating. Let, let's drill down more because that's, I think, at the edge of people's thinking, certainly quite at the edge of mine. You're saying it's possible to consider uh, engagement uh, and the opportunity to be self-sustaining without thinking about too much wages for doing a job, it's more possible to think about my shared ownership in an enterprise. Yeah, uh, I th That's I think a very different concept, or I maybe it isn't so different. It's a bit like the cooperatives, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, doing different ways of history, you see this. So in the early ways that, you know, we saw a big movement to everybody should have a home. You know, we saw that particularly in the 80s, there was, that, there was a big movement there. Uh, in, the, in the 30s in the UK and around the world, you know, this is because of the cooperative movement. And in, in Silicon Valley, that notion that more people should own a stake in a company, right? I think with robots coming online, we should be also thinking about maybe, you know, everybody one day should own a robot or several. And that robot is providing productive functions in society, generating services and money, um, but not just to one person who owns all the robots, but to whoever has the robots, who is right. closest to where the need is. Right? So, so that's good, because there you're, you're encouraging us to think about the social impact of ownership. So let me ask you a straight question then. And we, we've seen the uh, Silicon Valley, Google, Van, riots, not riots, but challenges. What should they do right now? What should Google be doing today to make sure they don't kick the, you know, stick their foot in it? Yeah, and I shouldn't, we shouldn't just uh, uh, target uh, or talk about Google in this context. <laughs> The big four I think or that five. They're, they're big enough to have earned the yeah. right to be used as an example. The big four or five <laughs> tech companies in China, whose whose market share, by the way, each is bigger than Google's. Yeah, by a lot. Are face, going to be facing a similar problem in China too? You know, in terms of hoovering up the innovation and the talent within the Chinese marketplace. I think for all of these companies, um, it comes down to this. Basically, I actually, literally, was with the head of Google UK a few weeks ago at a breakfast, and I asked him this question. You know, Google. Uh, these self-driving cars, or the Google Glass, all these technologies, it's kind of destroying jobs. What are you going to do about it? And the, the answer that was given to me was, well, 
eventually human society will evolve, just as through the Industrial Revolution, new jobs to replace the ones that were taken away, new trades. And the, you know, I had a problem, I had a slight problem with that because it, it wasn't just a random thing that happened. It was, particularly in Britain, most of the elite in this society didn't want to have happen to them what happened in France. So then they started to think, okay, we need to do something about, about the Industrial Revolution and all the slums. And they actually started to create new kinds of industries that specifically harnessed the excess labor that was coming in from the countryside. And then thought about how you know, they built entire cities for workers and so on and so forth. So the answer to Google is in, in, not just alongside innovating you new know, cars that drive themselves and Google Glass, how about innovating the new tech trades? For, you know, what is the equivalent of being a plumber in a 22nd century? Yeah. What does that look like and how can you seed that? Because if you don't start working on that now, you may not have a business in 10 or 20 years' That's time. That's a very interesting concept. And, and, and it, it actually took human, uh, humans en masse to create unions to create a balance. So let me ask you, will the robots ever have their union? Well, you know, it's really funny. The other night, I, uh, I was just accidentally uh, on TV, ended up watching The Matrix. It's um, never an accident. I'm always happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, watching The Matrix now yeah. versus over 10 years ago, it is even more terrifying than it was because we didn't have these concepts of singularity and the machines could take over and snoop on us. And, you know, The Matrix was just, wow, that would be amazing if, you know, we could experience that kind of... Uh, advanced technology. Now it's starting to happen. Oh, no. So Here, sorry. I think it is starting, you know, it is something we need to think about. We need okay. to have some, some actual, not so much heavy regulation, but we need to think about what the ground rules are going to be. Mm. Otherwise, we're going to see a lot of problems. Okay, this is, this is terrific. This is, a, this is a little surprising in terms of the conversation, but it's kind of where I was hoping to go. Rebecca, it's fine. We'll just keep going. It's, 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 no, no, I'm kidding. I want to make sure we give time to... Oh, I'm getting the two-minute signal. Or it could be something else. I'm not sure. Um, but I want to make sure we open it up to the audience to ask for, uh, for questions. And so if it's two minutes, maybe now's a good time. Hi, guys. Grab a microphone behind you. And uh, could I please... Uh, if, when, if you were going to ask a question, would you mind saying who you are, and then uh, shouting out your question. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Yula, and I run a company called Alice. Um, so on that topic, if you think teaching people to code, um, by the time they develop and be able to be good at coding, if they do become good at coding, because it's a bit like maths, and we've have taught maths for like years, and people aren't particularly good at that, mm. then what should people be taught instead? And if, since you have influence on policy, what are you advising? Yeah, that's a great mm. question. So, as I say, the three things that, the three areas of, in, of kind of skill that are hard for machines to replace, at least two of the three, but one is, as I say, manual direct dexterity, how to use your hands, and I guess beyond that, how to shape the physical world around you in innovative ways. Uh, creative intelligence, um, which is a lot about taking two ideas or two things or more that you wouldn't normally bring together and seeing what happens when you bring those two things together, right? And then building on the, the utility of what, what's being created. And social intelligence. Now, it's interesting tonight, you know, in the context of Silicon Dragon, the UK, uh, China, kind of Western, China, East kind of link, there's a lot of, of those three intelligences that you need. So in a way, if we could be educating our children, if we could be training ourselves and thinking about policy that can support cultural understanding, mm. right? Just literally, how do Chinese and Westerners think differently? I think there's a speaker here today who, who has sort of a background in that. That's one area that probably is just as valuable as coding, right? Coding I can do in a village hut in Cambodia. Un, you know, understanding how to eat with a Chinese person and do business is a bit harder, and you need a physical place to do it, right, where you can both meet. Or maybe not, but that's another story. Um, so I think we need to really think carefully about, yes, get all the basic skills, get everybody up to basic level, but then not be satisfied with that because that's just going to create a ton of people who know the same thing who all get paid very little to do it or get no jobs at all. Next question, please. Say who you are, please. Okay, uh, Gareth Wong, uh, Gambon in CXO. Um, very uh, thought-provoking, especially relating to Matrix because uh, it so happens that just two days ago I, I, I blogged based on... Um, Adam Grant, you know, the, the guy that wrote uh, Give and Take? Mm -hmm. um, he was talking about meaningful jobs. And in fact, I, I, I was mentioning and using Matrix as an example. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges I see is the population now, whether tech or not, 
most people are actually happily plugging themselves into the machine and not thinking. Mm. So my challenge was to, to, to say that maybe people should actually take a yellow pill, you know, to actually start thinking first and get themselves away from the machine. Mm. And of course, you know, that is before taking the red pill to know about all the problems, you know, of the world from finance to ecology to everything else and then get really depressed then. So just wonder your, your thoughts about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that this first wave of the web revolution, one of the things, there's a controversial writer who wrote the book called The Filter Bubble, and there's a tendency, it's not completely proven, but I kind of agree with some of the principles, for the web to reinforce the networks we already have, the people we already know, and the interests that we already have. So even, even though we have all these infinite websites we could look at, I mean, I for one, only surf about five or six you know, every day. Um, and so you, actually there's a danger it can limit your world and also reduce serendipity, innovation. It's very important that we accidentally meet people and mm -hmm. accidentally come across new ideas. And the web as it currently stands doesn't allow that serendipity to always to happen so easily. Um, the algorithms qu don't quite match the randomness that you can get from the high street, you know, the community center, the church, all the institutions which are now sort of dying because it's just too easy, it's far too easy just to go on YouTube or social media. However, these physical technologies, these robots, these 3D printers, these other technologies, start to make it easier to scale serendipity. Serendipity always fell behind, I think, versus pure digital uh, experiences or, or ways of you know, mm. trading, because serendipity requires you to work with a limited number of people, right? Even if, uh, one of the things I'm working on is with others trying to kind of create opportunities to network between the UK and different cities in China and Hong Kong, maybe using video and robots and stuff like that. Um, but you know, his, even if you can actually network with 1,000 people, our brains can only take 150. So if you want to network between London and, say, Beijing or Hong Kong, you've still got to find 75 people in Hong Kong or, Lond or Beijing, 75 people in London, and then find a way to meaningfully interact. Now, hit before, up until this last few years, that's just very hard to do. You have to fly over. You have to come to events like this. It doesn't scale. Right now, we're entering an age where it could potentially scale. And that's, that's when it becomes really interesting. And that's when we can start to get true innovation, I think, which is what happens often by accident between people who don't necessarily normally mix, solving problems they didn't know they needed to solve. Well, Lord Wei, um, I just want to spend the whole evening chatting with you. And I'm so sorry that we can't uh, have any more uh, at, at the moment. Uh, we've had a very clear wind-up signal, and don't mess with Rebecca. So, uh, uh, want to, firstly, from my own perspective, thank you so much. What a terrific thank conversation. You. Thank you uh, also for listening and sharing. If you wouldn't mind putting your hands together and thanking Lord Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much.